<clears throat> we're going to sort of apply uh, what Larry shared in his testimony last week, and that is to share Christ, to bear witness to the faith that Jesus Christ has put within us, and to understand that God's promises and God's constant work is to bring people to him that he wants to save us to redeem us and so when you see Abraham Isaac and Jacob you're looking at a prescribed history and outcome that God wants to accomplish in people's lives remember this that God loves everyone God loves everyone, and he wants them to know him and to have relationship with him and to actually benefit and be blessed by him. Have you ever known someone, even though you love them, even though you care about them, even though you've done everything you can, they just simply will not accept it? Have you ever known someone like that? Yeah, no matter what you say, it, it, they just simply don't want it. And I want you to understand that that's, that's true, actually, you know, with God's people. Uh, there are people who God calls, but they don't come. God asks, but they don't answer. God loves, but they don't receive. And it's important to understand that this is something that actually happens on a regular basis. And, you know, one of the things that, that I think is really true is that the Bible actually really is very much like life. We got a father who made some kids, and the kids what? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it, it, it's, it's just a part of it. In this case, this father actually sacrificed himself in order that his kids might have life. Life after rejection. And so I want to, I want to kind of just sort of bring a little bit of understanding to everything that we're looking at as we come to the end of Genesis. We've been in Genesis, and now we're in the 49th chapter. And I wanted us to see in chapter 15, it said this, Then the Lord said to Abram, now remember his name is Abram because he's not yet changed. I, I remember when I was a brand new Christian, one of my roommates in college was from Nigeria. And he explained to me how uh, in Nigeria, when you come to Christ, they actually change your name and give you a Christian name. And his name was Abraham. Abraham Andero. And uh, he was my roommate. But they, they literally changed people's names in Nigeria, Christianity, at least when I was in college. And here we have Abram, who has not yet actually become Abraham. And you got Sarai, who hasn't become Sarah, until they actually trust God and follow God and God works in their life. Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years. You see, this is foretelling what's going to actually take place. That the children of Israel are actually going to, Abraham's children are going to end up in a place for 400 years and they're actually going to be enslaved. And that's what we're going to be looking at as we go forward into Exodus but notice here that he's telling them in advance. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. I mean, these are promises, and God promises that he's going to do a certain thing, and he always brings it about. He always brings it about. Sometimes we have trouble with the timing. God promises to bless us. God promises to bless us. God promises to work in our lives. God promises to change our heart. God promises to change our mind. God promises to make things in our lives better. But it takes time. It takes time. In Genesis chapter 50, we see this when... Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and now Jacob's son Joseph, who has actually provided for and saved his entire people. And when everything comes to conclusion, this is what he said. 
verse 15 of Genesis 50. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. Have you ever had your siblings and you're at the house and the parents leave? And then what happens? Chaos. Yes. Uh, you know, my kids have told me about things that actually happened while we were gone. I mean, you just don't know these things, you know. And uh, they tell me about the things they did and so on and so forth. And uh, Sethi, when uh, Maddie came into the family, Seth took Maddie upstairs and he drew a line in, the, in his room, which he had never shared with another human being. And the line was kind of like this. This is mine. This is yours. <laughs> <laughs> and so he dared him to cross, go across that line. And, you know, Joseph's brothers, even though he has not yet brought retribution, but actually brought forgiveness, they are still concerned. They're still worried. Now that their father had died, that somehow or another he will actually use his power and position to hurt them. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin, because they did evil to you. Now this is the heart of a father, isn't it? This is the heart of any parent. By the way, this is the heart of God. God wants all his creation to be reconciled to him. All of them. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants, which the Lord gave him in a dream long before it ever happened. Many, 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 almost an entire century. And there Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for I am, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good, to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. I want to point something out to you that I, I've come to realize as I've lived my faith. I began to notice in all of creation, all God made is alive and reproduces. Everything that God has made is alive and reproduces. A lot of people have trouble with the fact that evil exists in the world. But you see, you, you can't have freedom and not have people use it for ill. But remember this, God did not make death and God did not make this world to be like it is. It is something that we chose. And every person chooses and is born with a sinful nature. And I want you to understand, the less there is of God, the more there is of death and pain. The less there is of God, the more there is of death and pain. You see, all the time, people will take a really good thing and reach out for something that's not good. They do it all the time. Now, the easiest way to see it is a cow in a field that has green grass right before it, and where does it go? Through the fence to get grass that's already on this side. And it's not just cows, other animals do it the same. And the truth is, is that you know, you're not satisfied with what you have, and so you reach out for something else, even though you've been foretold and warned that it's not good for you. It's not good for you. I wanna encourage us to understand Joseph, he is just like God. And he understands that God is the judge and that he is not the judge and that they should not be afraid of him because he's just like them. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, you see a synopsis 
of all of God's work and salvific work throughout history. His salvific work throughout history. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by whom? His son. Whom he appointed the heir of all things. Through whom also he created the world. So this is not just a prophet. He is creator God. Jesus is God in human flesh. Totally human, totally God. Don't, don't let anybody fool you. Don't let anybody fool you. And people that want to say that there's, you know, polytheism in Christianity and so on, so it's not true. There's one God, three persons, the Trinity. And the Trinity is so important to the everyday part of life because we all need to understand that we need to work together, that we need each other, and that when we all join together in one purpose, guess what? We do well. We do well. But Jesus is actually sent in these last days, and he is the heir of all things, through he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God. Kind of reminds me of parents standing at a glass looking in where babies are laying. And I guess which one they think's the cutest. Theirs, of course. Theirs. And they're both competing for whose eyes, whose nose, whose hair, whose nose, whose fingers. But the fact is, is that Jesus is the actual glory and exact imprint of God. He's God in human flesh. So his life is not just a life, but also an example. It is an example of what life really is like and how to live it. And Jesus, in all of his actions, never sinned, ever. They're always trying to make Jesus do something that he never did. They're always trying to get him to think for him that he thought thoughts like they do. And I want you to understand that Jesus was the exact radiance and glory of God, the exact imprint of God's nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for what? Sins. Uh, This is the deal. Jesus did not come to just do some good teaching alone. He came to take care of a serious deficit in human lives. The purification of sins. Jesus' first sermon, a lot shorter than mine, was what? Repent. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven in Matthew, the kingdom of God elsewhere, is at hand. It's at hand. Then he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. There are so many things that we could talk about, about Jesus sitting down. Every priest that ever took care of the tabernacle and the temple, nobody ever sat down. It is covered by the cherubim and seraphim. The mercy seat is covered. No one can sit there. But when Jesus Christ finished his work, he sat down. Why? Because it's finished. Last night at about, I don't know, 8.30, 9 o'clock, I sat down. That's the last thing I remember. <laughs> like a Thanksgiving turkey. I was done. And that's the thing that Jesus actually did. He sat down. Now, the reason I want you to understand is this. His work is God's work. It's perfect work. It's complete work. It is finished in him. Hebrews tells us what God's plan actually is. Then in chapter 2 it says, Therefore... 
we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by the angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, okay, How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? I want to point this out. Today, everybody acts like there's no hell. It, it boggles my mind. I suppose it's kind of like this. You take a test, but it doesn't matter if you show up you still get an A. And that just doesn't make sense. What's the point of having a grade if you get it without even trying? But understand this. Jesus not only just purified sin, but he actually, he actually removed the punishment for anyone who would believe in him for the punishment of their sins, which is eternal hell. Eternal hell. It's hard for me as a pastor because everybody goes to heaven now. I decided a long time ago, I don't put anybody in heaven and I don't put anybody in hell. I don't do that. So I don't preach people's lives whenever I do a funeral. As in, this person is definitely a Christian or anything like that. I just preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Anybody ever asked me to do a funeral? I said, just remember, I'm going to preach Jesus. You understand that, right? Because so many people today, of course, don't believe that there is a hell. But I want you to understand, Jesus did not just simply reveal heaven. He also revealed the way out of hell. And it says that Jesus went to hell and proclaimed the actuality of his work to those in hell. These are not stories. This is the reality of his actual, physical, cosmic existence. And we need to be very careful because we can begin to feel like everybody goes to heaven. (coughs) Pardon me. Meaning, there's nothing to escape. But there is. There's something to escape, folks. Jesus didn't die on the cross just for grins. Father, if this cup could pass from me, but not my will, your will be done. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The earth shook. The ground opened up. Cosmic, seismic things took place because, you see, all of creation has fallen. And Jesus Christ is the second Adam, the provision for sin, to restore what was broken. To restore what was broken. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. And in Jesus' life, he gave us what we have come to call the great co-mission. We have a mission as believers in Jesus Christ. A co, meaning everybody, is on mission. A co mission. And it is in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, because Jesus, after having died, buried, and resurrected on the third day, he appeared to over 500 people over 40 days. And he gave this to his disciples. This is what he said. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
For what? To go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. All nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. you not to shut up. I want to encourage you not to be quiet. I want to encourage you to take full possession of your faith. Take full hold of what Jesus Christ has done in your life and tell other people. One of the difficult things for me is that <clears throat> I'm a pastor and because I am a pastor it sort of is sort of just expected of me to actually share my faith. But I want you to know something. When I was a brand new believer in Fort Collins, Colorado, I went door to door from house to house and shared my faith. Not because I was paid, but because I believed, because Jesus Christ worked in my life. When I was a new Christian, I went to the Mall of Boulder. If you've ever been there, you'll understand what I'm talking about. I walked in around and talked to everybody. We called them freaks, but anyway, that's just, that's Colorado language. The bottom line is that I shared my faith with people, always, everywhere, all the time. 
My dad had employees. I shared my faith with all my father's employees, always talking to, especially Mac, who was an avowed atheist from England, had a master's in economics and wanted to be a politician someday. When I was a school bus driver, I shared with all the kids and all the drivers. When we sat and waited for the kids to come out, I shared with them about Jesus Christ. I share with my neighbors, I share with my friends, I share with my family, I share with everyone I can all the time. Why? Not because I'm paid. As a matter of fact, I was threatened to be fired if I talked about Jesus Christ. I was fired off of a job in Wyoming because I shared Jesus Christ. I just want you to understand, this is our story, this is our faith, and we should not neglect so great a salvation. And it's important for other people to know this. In John chapter 3, Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is what? Born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Dying does not bring you the kingdom of God. Being born again brings the kingdom of God in your life. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? The answer, of course, is no. But he's not talking about a physical birth out of the womb. He's talking about a spiritual birth out of God's heart, out of the work of Christ. I don't, I, I just, you know, I get such a kick out of the movie industry that adopts basically all of the Christian message and tries to make it theirs. But I will tell you this, anybody who believes in Jesus Christ, their dead flower will come alive. Their life will be intricately tied to Jesus Christ. And you may suffer for your faith, but I want you to understand you will receive a reward in eternal salvation. And it will mean a lot when you're on the other side of death. And I want us to understand, how can a man be born again when he's old? He can't. Can he enter a second time? No. Shows Nicodemus took it seriously. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. So today, as you leave, you'll be given five of these cards. Five of these cards. These cards say on them, you're invited. You use them however seems appropriate to you. But this is to give the opportunity to invite someone to come to church. People are looking for answers, my friends. They're looking for answers. You do realize that alcohol is at an epidemic. STDs are at an epidemic. Obesity is at an epidemic. Why do you think all these things are happening? Because you see people are stressed out. They're scared to death. And we haven't even seen the economics come into play yet. But one day that bill will come true. And people will have to pay. And what I'm trying to say to you is this. People are looking for answers. They're looking for answers. God is the only one that can give you peace. Amen. Eternal, everlasting peace. Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. Almighty God. Wonderful Counselor. So today, we're going to give you these cards. And I'm going to ask you to share your faith. Share your faith. I want to encourage you to do it. Many of you are in the military and you provide actually for freedom around the world and there's freedom supposedly here in the United States. I would like to see you use it as long as you got it because I'm telling you right now if you don't start sharing your faith you're going to lose it. Eventually they're going to tell you that you can't talk about Jesus. You realize down in Houston that the mayor of Houston asked for all the pastors to submit their sermons? Our founding fathers are going nuts. You're what? <laughs> Censure all the pastors in the United States of America? What I'm trying to tell you is, my friends, do not neglect your opportunity to share your faith. I don't have any trouble at all sharing with people because I know if you're a drunk, it's going to make you clean. If you're an addict, you're going to get clean. 
If you're angry, it's going to make you happy. If you're divided, it's going to bring you together. If you're troubled, it's going to give you answers. If you don't have purpose, it's going to give you meaning. What I want you to understand is this is the answer. Now, many of you might be a little concerned, you know, because there's so many uh, things you might have to answer and so on. On the back is a list of many videos, and there's many, many more. And they are short vignettes of four or five minutes to give people a biblical answer to a lot of the issues that we deal with today. And that will, you can look at it yourself and kind of school yourself a little bit. But this allows you to say, just take a look at the website and there'll be many answers to your questions. I'd just like to invite you to church. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to move these marbles from one place to the other, one invitation at a time. Next Sunday, if you gave out all five, you can take five marbles and put them in the empty jars. I've already given out mine, but I'm going to wait till next Sunday to put them in the jars. I'm going to put them in there with you. Our goal is to move 5,000 of these marbles from one place to the other by 5,000 witnesses for Jesus Christ. Okay? You can be really, really, you know, I mean, you can be uh, big picture if you want. Just walk into a restaurant, give it all to everybody. By the time they throw you out, you'll be done. <laughs> you know how I know that? I've done it many times. Many times. No problem. We'll go. No problem. I want to encourage you, folks. Look. We need to share faith. People need Jesus. They need God in their life. They need to know the one who made them and be restored to him. We are way too complex for it to be an accident. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand together.